to what extent do we need to protect the night sky uh, from human activities in space? Three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. You guys, to say that I'm excited to share this video with you is an understatement. I got a chance to talk with a Harvard astrophysicist for over an hour. We talked about several different topics, so I'm actually gonna break up this video into several different videos on specific topics. While we have covered some amazing examples of how Starlink satellites are already making a major impact in the world, it's also important to think about the larger picture as it's not just Starlink satellites that are racing to get some real estate in space. We also have Amazon's Project Kuiper on the way. We have China having their own operation of getting satellites into low Earth orbit. There are gonna be a lot more satellites and constellations of these low Earth orbit satellites. And I think it's a really relevant, important topic to discuss what the future looks like. It's important to consider the impact on astronomy, both for stargazing and for professional research. So I think that these are some really important questions to ask. Jonathan McDowell is a Harvard astrophysicist and he just gave me some great insight into what our world could look like even a hundred years from now. So let's get right into it. The concerns with not just, you know, stargazing astronomy, but also with the research. Right, right. So just to summarize where we are since I made that PowerPoint. June 2020, right? Right, exactly. So SpaceX have made some changes, right? So that now all the satellites have visors, uh, which decreases their brightness a bit. And also they've changed the attitude control law, uh, which means the way that they're pointing uh, uh, as they raise their orbits is a little different. It doesn't reflect the sun down as much. And so little changes like that, right, make a big difference. Um, uh, and also they've abandoned plans to have a higher orbit shell. And so all of those changes mean the typical brightness once they're in their operational orbit has gone from bright enough to just see from a dark site uh, with the naked eye to not quite bright enough to see, right? It's a small change, but it's enough. My concern was not so much these low orbit chains of 60 that you see that you go in the sky, you look up and you go, holy crap, what's that? It's aliens, right? That's only during the launch phase. But my concern is that you get to a point where um, if you have all these sixth magnitude, fifth magnitude objects, uh, tens of thousands of them at, at, at 500 kilometers, um, the night sky from a dark site, from like when you're out hiking in the, you know, the desert or somewhere like that, uh, um, you'd look up and you'd see the sky just kind of swimming in what I imagine might be make you feel a little nauseous, right? Uh, you know, because there's all of these things just at the limit of vision, but right. the sky is no longer static, right? And, and that would be, that would, uh, and even if they're a little brighter than that, what you see is just huge numbers of satellites, more than there are visible stars, as you can't see the constellations. And so that, you know, from a cultural point of view, for many cultures around the world, including many who have no, you know, in involvement in, in space activities, um, you know, it, to have that change on them seems like something that if we're going to do it, we should do it, you know, we should do it in a very deliberate manner discussed with the UN and not just arbitrarily right. uh, the FCC say it's fine. And, and the thing is, okay, so maybe we're not in that situation anymore with Starlink, but that's not to say that some other company in some other country perhaps couldn't do exactly the same thing and put us in that situation. I'm not so much like Stop Starlink as let's have international regulation on this subject because this is an environmental issue and it is one that the whole world potentially has, you know, is an interested party, right? Right. And, and so we want, and so we've raised this with the UN, with the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We had a conference partly sponsored by the UN, the Dark and Quiet Skies Conference at the end of last year. And so I think this is now on the agenda going forward of to what extent do we need to protect the night sky uh, from human activities in space. And, and I think it's not a, you know, oh, don't have the mega constellations. It's, it's let's talk about 
how many satellites of X brightness can we sustain at, you know, at X altitude? Like that, Do you right? like um, SpaceX's response to you know making modifications like the visor in the dark sat and trying to you know take these consequences into consideration? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're very happy that they've engaged with us in in a positive way. And you know, to what extent that is? I mean, I know some people at SpaceX really want to help us on this, and maybe other people don't care so much but don't want the bad PR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. And, and so, you know, it's hard to say what the mix of that is at the corporate level. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, can you trust what they say? But, but uh, so I think we have to keep the pressure up and not necessarily trust in their, their, their good right. political, <clears throat> point of view. Right. Um, uh, oh, I've had very good interactions with the, the SpaceX people that I've, I've talked with. And, and it's a relief that they've made these changes. Now, right. is that going to save the other issue, which is, uh, satellite streaks on our big telescope images, and it's gonna it's gonna mitigate it, but it may not save us entirely. Uh, so I'm hoping that it's at the level that will for Starlink will will move it from oh we're really screwed to oh that's a pain in the neck right. that we that we can sort of live with. Uh, whereas the one web because they're at this higher orbit, so let me just go through the higher orbit issue, is that if you're in a higher orbit, and that, by that I mean 1,200 kilometers instead of 600. Uh, so first, of course, there's a bigger area on the Earth that can see that given satellite, right? Because it's right. higher. But also, that satellite can see the sun later into the night than a lower orbit satellite. Right, so the sun is set from where you are, but not from where the satellite is. So, in fact, at that altitude, uh, in summer, uh, the satellites are illuminated all through the night. And so, even at midnight, if you have a if you had a full originally planned one web constellation of forty eight thousand satellites, you would have several hundred satellites high in the sky illuminated at midnight in summer. Uh, um, uh, that would get you to the point of like roughly one streak per image that you took in a wide field telescope. Mm -hmm. and, and so that would be very bad for us. It's a lot worse than having them lower down where in the middle of the night, typically you're fine, you can observe. Um, having said that, there are kinds of astronomy that do look near, there's many more satellites near the horizon illuminated, right? right. And so the worst case is if you're trying to do astronomy that requires you to look near the horizon at kind of early in the night or late in the, you know, just before dawn, right? Uh, and that's where you're gonna see loads of satellites buzzing around the, the horizon illuminated. It's sort of like if you live near an airport, you see all the planes. So why would you need to do that? Um, you'd need to do that if you were hunting for asteroids or comets that are near the sun. So the thing is, right, that if an asteroid is sort of in an orbit that's not very distant from the sun, then when you're looking at it, it's close to the sun in the sky. So you've got to wait till the sun goes below the horizon that the asteroid isn't. And so that's just at that time, right? So that's the kind of science that I predict will be most impacted by these constellations. It's also the kind of science that's most critical to keeping us alive, right? Because in, in the sense of, you know, uh, you really don't want to miss the asteroid that might someday come and hit us. I was going to say, is this like a real safety concern, a threat? I mean, yes and no. The, the dinosaur killer asteroid kind of thing is pretty rare, right? But the city buster one is not. Uh, you know, the, the risk in the next hundred years that you get something like the thing that blew up over Chelyabinsk, but it actually, you know, hits the surface and hits the city, is it's not big, but it's enough that I think we should be, it, it, it's sort of not out of range of other um, risks that we try and do something about. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and so so I am concerned. I, I, I think that this is important science to map the small rocks so that we have adequate warning if there's one uh, that you know. Even though we're not at the point yet where we can do anything about it, apart from evacuate or you know. Uh, um, but 
uh, we may be 20 years from now, you know, people are working on that side of the problem too. So it's important for us to, to, uh, um, to sort of have that situational awareness, right? To have that, you know, uh, uh, what, what are the rocks we need to worry about? And, and so I think uh, losing that capability would be serious. Right. Uh, and I think right now with the predicted Starlink and OneWeb constellations, um, the, uh, it's not clear to me how much of that we'll lose, right? But it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a problem because it's about, you know, what you're doing is you're looking for, for these searches, you have a wide field of view. And so that's the worst case because then you'll get more satellite streaks, right? And your background's kind of high. So if you lose any sensitivity, uh, um, your background's kind of high because it's like just after, it's not full dark night. Right. Uh, and, and so if you lose any sensitivity, that's bad because you're already at the limit of, of, of sensitivity. You're looking for faint things. And so what, what you can get is if there's a streak that can affect the camera, even not just where the streak is, but you can get sort of scattered light uh, that that can sort of raise the overall background level potentially, uh, and uh, and obviously if the if the streak covers where your asteroid is, you're 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 hosed. So it's not clear how bad it will be yet, but it's worrying. Uh, and and I think that if you get you know a situation where you have hundred thousand satellites, uh, half of them you know from one web and a Chinese thing at, at a thousand kilometers, you know, uh, then I think even the midnight astronomy is, is going to be severely impacted. And so the thing is, right, if there's like one streak every two images, okay. So that just slows down the progress of the field because you have to take twice as many images. Right. Uh, but if there's five streaks per image, <laughs> uh, and you know, the, you can do software to like make the picture pretty again by taking out the streaks. Right. You can measure things to a 1% accuracy <laughs> after you've done that. Right. And that, that's that. That's the thing I think a lot of lay people don't understand about the professional astronomy is, is that we're not just taking pictures. We're making very precise measurements from the data. Uh, and and so if you if you have to mess with massage the data to get rid of streaks, that's uh, that that's potentially going to going to compromise the science. So it's a it's a tricky problem. Maybe you can do things like so the satellite crosses the field of view very fast. So if you had another camera going warning there's a satellite coming and you put like a piece of paper in front of the telescope for, for, for five seconds and then away again so that your 10 minute long exposure because this is you know what another thing people don't realize is when I take when I go to the mountain and take an image right i don't just go click right I, I hold the shutter down and i wait like 10 minutes <laughs> and then i release right that that because we're looking for such faint things you have yes. to expose for a long time and that's why you know the probability that the satellite comes across in that time is not small um but so in principle if you if you could you know, protect the telescope as the satellite was passing. So that, but that, you know, is expensive, right? Because for every telescope now, we have hundreds of professional telescopes, all slightly different designs, all optimized for slightly different kinds of science. We'll do it if we have to, but but it's not going to be cheap. Um, uh, so there are things you can maybe, and that works up to a certain number of satellites. You know, as you get more satellites, if you have to do that all the time, then that doesn't help you. Um, so there's a, there is a limit as to what we can mitigate. And, and what I imagine is this, right now, if you wanna launch a satellite in the US, you go to the FCC and you fill out what's called an ODAR, an Orbital Debris Assessment Report, that convinces the FCC that you're not going, to, that your satellite is gonna re-enter within a reasonable time, that right. it's not gonna release huge amounts of junk, that it's not gonna be a huge problem for space debris. I'm imagining that you also have to do another fill in another section of this which shows how much light pollution you're going to generate yeah what what you're what you're doing to mitigate that and that then there would be some regulation that says you know we can only have x hundred satellites of this brightness up at any one time right and and so that wouldn't you know that might mean you know that maybe one web has one of the UK licensed thing, not the US, but the principle is the same. You know, maybe they can only have um, 
2,000 satellites instead of 8,000 or, you know, some, some constraint like that, which means that, you know, they have to change their design to have slightly higher power transmitters rather than lower power transmitters on many satellites. You know, there's design trades, right? Right. So if you give the engineers constraints, they'll make the trade slightly differently. Right. Right. And maybe then that cuts their profit margin by 10% or something like that. But, but uh, so does their business case not close? It's unclear. The future I see is one, you know, where it's like that, where there are, you know, there are sort of slot assignments and constraints and design constraints in your satellite that you have to follow the same way that you have to follow it for space debris right now. Right. Uh, right. And it won't stop you having fairly big constellations of satellites, but it will somewhat constrain what you can do. Again, thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you like getting news about Starlink, please hit subscribe. And I have a lot of fascinating content and I am just getting started. I can't wait to share it all with you.